Hey guys, welcome back to the Mind Body Broadcast. It's Austin and Marty, and today we are going to touch on training programming. Yes, sir. Um, touch on variables that make up training. You know what what you need to progress. What might be good for you. What might not be good for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, discuss from there. I think I think uh, we we started to kind of get off track a little bit in the episode we did on intensity. For sure, and we. We kind of stopped ourselves because we we were t- talking about training programming a lot. So we're going to make this a whole separate episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because, yeah, like a lot of the stuff we were diving a little bit too far into was taking away from from exactly that. And then we had this great idea, of course, because we always have great ideas, right, to make this a little sure. bit more education informational <laughs> on the different modalities of training programming because that can mean – a lot of things, right? Like uh, I, I even know when I say a workout, people they think that's cardio. So then I've kind of really taken back my words when I say workout. I'll say resistance training, or I, I, I sometimes I don't even you don't even use a weight training because what if it is a a uh, body weight circuit or something like that that I'll have someone do for cardio or something because it's it's uh, clarifying a lot of that stuff too to make sure that no one gets confusing. But I love the word training a lot because. Training means preparing for something, right? Like I like workout. It, it's you know, it's just a, one of those things inside my head, I guess, where a workout is is this, whereas training is exactly you're getting you're getting better at something, right? And that's why I think a training program in the weeks that are involved in it that is you know leading from one thing to another. Uh, have you heard anything kind of like that before? Is that kind of your justification? Yeah, that's yep. definitely my thought on it because um, there is no one size fits all, and we'll mm-hmm. and you know I don't know. And I would imagine your philosophy is going to be kind of similar to mine in this, but I, I do get people that ask me, you know, what do you think about what, you know, some of the, let's think of some of the popular training programs. Um, you'll, you'll have DC training or you'll have some of, uh, FST you know, seven mountain, mountain dog. Yep. You know, things like that, which they're very well-known programs. They have, I would say that they do have some, some of the better programs, you know, fortitude training, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, they do have. They do have science behind them. Mm-hmm. Um, they do have, it's not just like haphazardly throwing things together, but, and when people ask me, well, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? I'm like, it's fine in the right context. That's right. Absolutely. I can agree with you more. And that's the answer to everything because I mean, uh, I would never, you know, I would never go out and suggest to someone that, you know, this is the best training system. Do right. this right. type of thing. Um, Go ahead. No, Go it's, ahead. It, it's 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 wonderful you said that too because even if you you find one of these systems, let's say it's a seven out of ten or an eight out of ten, I think then the marriage between coach and client is because we we kind of talked about that before is that we can't actually work out for the client as a we'll say an adept coach, but they have to give you the feedback, and not only that, but then between studying their structure, studying their feedback, is that then you can maybe tweak something like that to make that, we'll call it, ideal program for at least the next training block. Because I find that, let's say, because I've used John's programs before, I trained with John Meadows uh, for quite some time, and I enjoyed everything about it, and then I kind of took away, we'll say, my notes for myself in terms of just paying attention, proprioceptive awareness, see what muscles grew, what muscles didn't, and then I can make, we'll call them mega programs or whatever, right? And I think that's where a lot of people will fall behind in a sense of that they, like you said, they, they will dive into one system and they will believe in it and then they don't really know what's going from there but then they'll have something like a sense of their arms aren't big enough or let's say their chest is not growing enough and well that's when now that really highly specialized stuff will come into play because i i really do firmly believe that if you are rank beginner starting out in the gym you should do something that's borderline cookie cutter because but it has to be a good quality cookie cutter let's say if you only have 3 days a week do something full body if you only have if you have 4 days a week maybe an upper lower split it will work like that but for to dive into something not only advanced from the beginning uh, you, you don't necessarily need something advanced. So the, the example I like to use is that, uh, when I see bikini girls, especially when they'll get to a chest day <laughs> and they've never worked out before ever. And they have, you know, that we'll say the bro split, the b- one body part per, per day, Monday through Friday, chest, shoulders, back, arms, legs, and their chest day, they will just wreck themselves because a lot yeah. of them haven't done a full chest, let alone they don't need one full chest day 
to there. So, but then where I'm going with this is that once you do put in, we'll say the foundation work at the beginning for programming, and then you, you make notes and then you work with the coach and he, he or she actually takes those notes and goes, okay, uh, for instance, Austin can't do, um, Romanian deadlifts because of X reason, or he doesn't feel them or the, if the technique is good, it still doesn't feel them. Okay. We don't do those. And that's where, the coach and client need to get out of their own way in this, in a form of arrogance or conceit and just and kind of give in in a sense of, you know, let's try this out because it's going to be better for you. And it's not necessarily going to be something that will stay forever, such as maybe mountain dog programs have taken you so far. I'm not picking on John here. I really like his programs. I'm just saying, for instance, let's say someone doesn't find it has enough of X in it for them or has too much of Y in it for them. That's when you can build the ultimate program. Yeah, and I bet you too. If you talk to somebody like John, he would probably, he would probably tell you, "Hey, um, my programming's great." Because I think, I think too, his he does have multiple programs, and there's some there's some auto regulation like within them to an extent. Of course, um, but he'd probably tell you, "Hey, I could." I could do even better if you worked with me directly. You know what? Um, you know what? I, I will say right that right there is that I rem- I did. This is excellent. You said that when I was training with John. I said, because my, my chest is still one of the one of my weaker body parts, but it's come a long way. I said, John, the only thing I actually feel right now is one arm pec deck. And he said, Kate Marty, at the beginning of every single chest day, you're doing 12 to 15 one arm pec decks nice and slow before you do anything so that you at least worked it in one way and not just doing an yep. exercise where something else is going to take over. And that blew my, that was probably the first time I had a coach that actually um, worked with me. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, holy. And so then we just added them in at the beginning. I was like, this is awesome. So not only did I have a big, big feeling of, uh, we'll say, respect or that my opinion or thoughts mattered, it just, yeah, it, it was awesome. So, yeah, exactly like that. He would work with you, right? That's, that's yes. And it's not, and you're not going to see stuff, you know, those little nuances like that. You're not going to see that on training programming because the person that wrote it doesn't know you. That's right. You know, and that's, and that's just it. So, you know, that kind of brings us to, you know, we got that point across, obviously one, if you're looking at programming and you're a novice, um, you know, look, find something that's progressive that allows you to Mm -hmm. add weight to the bar, uh, maybe add volume over time, you know, et cetera. Um, but as you kind of get past that point, you know, you need to realize that there, there has to be there has to be not only customization, but there has to be adaption, mm, um, yep. you know, throughout time so that before we kind of go into that part, like I said, you know, when we started, maybe just kind of touch on some of the main variables a little bit. So people know, you know, what people that are maybe a little newer know what the variables are. Um, like, like we were talking about, uh, volume, mm-hmm. obviously just, you know, the total amount of work that you're doing. So, um, I know that if you were to look at actual literature on training, we'll give you a little science, you know, um, volume and progressive overload are probably the two main contributors to hypertrophy. Yes, I um, agree. I agree. And no one's really going to argue that. And then, and, uh, they might have, you know, somebody might say, okay, volume matters more, or somebody might say progressive overload matters more, but that's neither, you know, here nor there. Correct. Um, and, you know, when we already talked about intensity and regulating intensity, and we'll talk about that too, as we go kind of regulating intensity within the programs. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, so those are going to be your two main, your probably your two main drivers of muscle growth. And assuming we're training for, you know, outside of maybe training really close to a show and just kind of protecting yourself from injury, let's say we're, we're actually trying to gain muscle tissue. There should be some some form of progression within your programming. Right. 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 Um, and it's not and you know, and the thing about an advanced trainee where it gets tricky is it's not linear progression because we can't, we can't just add weight to the bar on the same exercise and, you know, infinitely forever. Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, and we can, we can talk about some of those maybe other things that you like to do or that I like to do to kind of sure. a little trickery, if you will. But yeah, I mean, progressive overload, that's, and that's the basis of some programs, you know, just strictly progressive overload. Look at something like uh, DC training, for mm-hmm. example. Yep. Um, that's pretty much the basis of the entire program. It's low volume, it's high intensity, and you are adding weight to the bar as often as possible. That's right. Yeah. Um, 
and, and people get people get big doing it. And it's and I'm I'm loving that you're bringing up DC training because it has a, this wicked rebound spike. Like I remember reading on Skip's IntenseMuscle.com. I want to say. 2007 2008 and i was late to the game then like there was already tons of stuff out uh, dante wasn't even taking clients on anymore at that time but it was out there and i thought and like and it blew my mind that i was so unaware of uh of, of the system in a sense of how it was like you said that super high intensity super high weight and low volume uh which was a borderline dipping into um powerlifting stuff on the on the rest pause stuff we won't, we won't we'll you can go search for DC train we're not going to tell you everything about that there but and, and then there is the exact opposite end of the spectrum we'll call them the weeder programs which i know there is lots of different versions around it which would be um higher rep higher volume and longer workouts but then the the weight would be considerably less so where where i'm going to go with that is that if you are uh, embarking in a program like let's say let, let's let's for instance say that dc training instead of the one rest pause set had three rest pause sets like that's just now you're getting ludicrous with both not only are you changing the low volume to high volume then you have high intensity and you have high weight it, it's like it's almost like being in a like a you, you have a diet and you got now you got high protein high, high carbohydrate and high fat well, <laughs> well, it's it's not that that won't work. It's just that that is gonna. What do you know? What's working in a, in a sense then too? And and if you burn out on the DC training, was it the volume for you? Was it the weight for you? Something will give if you have all three of those variables absolutely cranked to the wall. Like it, it's just not gonna not only last for long, right. but uh, I don't I don't even know what you would use as a as a gauge of progress there if you didn't tweak one thing or you didn't try to implement one thing it's it's going to be really rough like i will tell you flat out that i did dc training and i am a very narrow shouldered guy i've got extremely long femurs and i i it wasn't for me and i i really wish it was for me in a sense cuz i love the program but uh i just don't get the the stimulus uh that that others do i don't have the chassis i'm not built like dusty hanshaw who obviously beat that program into the ground like his his transformation's been phenomenal but uh, but yeah, I just either kept getting hurt, and this was outside of technique being good, outside of a warm up, outside of stretching, and everything like that. But for instance, so now uh, this is a, this is a great great way to, to talk about what we can take away from stuff is that I really liked a lot of the extreme stretching stuff that was in there. So then there, so now now I, it wasn't all for not me doing the DC training, but I was like, oh, okay, so now this is really good. I can apply that. So then that can be a, a trick in Marty's we'll say a uh, perfect training programming toolbox. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're taking, you're taking away things from different programs and you're applying them to what you're doing. I mean, that's, that's not because you can, you can also combine those variables together. You know, right, right. it's just, it's just really what it is. It's just, it's just figuring out what combination of variables you need. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. It's not necessarily like you need this or you need that. I mean, both, if you can, uh, cause you'll have people in one camp or the other that'll say, you know, volume is the end all be all for or, sure. for sure. Or, uh, progressive overload is the end all be all. Well, and really, I mean, personally, I would rather take advantage of every, every avenue of hypertrophy that I can. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's going to be, you know, Maybe I'll have to break that up into phases. It might not all be at the same time, but for me, you know, if I can implement somehow implement volume, more volume, if I can somehow implement um, intensity and when, you know, when do I do these things? If I can, I need to implement progressive overload and then I can even implement little things like um, the really extreme high rep stuff for capillary density where I'm actually just the blood volume. Absolutely. Absolutely inflammation and swelling and things like that. I mean, because it's like, how do I figure out my pro it's funny because my programs will look like sometimes if I really have the person dialed in, you know, if I've, if I've worked with them for a little while and, and they give good feedback, my programs will look like such a mismatch of all kinds of stuff together. Mm -hmm. And, but it works because I know how they react. And, uh, 
you know, I figured out that formula. Absolutely. And and it's, and that's why I actually wrote a blog about this and I don't see a lot of people kind of taking it to, to value, but uh, the people that have either heard about it or read about it, they go, Oh, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's the need state, right? For instance, let's say, and it's not saying it can't work, but let's say you were doing a progressive overload, everything, every program you did for a year, two years, whatever was always put more weight on the bar or do a couple more reps inside of a rep range or something like that. And that was, it was just to always get stronger. Now, I really like that you said about like the high rep capillary training stuff. Like there is so much benefit to that in a sense of not only cardiovascular capacity, recovery capacity but if you don't blend things not necessarily w- within the program you can but i will touch on that later but if you let's say you did a whole uh 10 to 16 20 week whatever block of just progressive overload maybe your next program should be a little bit different in a sense of maybe it could be higher volume and then not only that but then then if, if you've never done something higher volume you're going to see all this n- newfound strength that you had from the progressive overload is going to transfer into the volume stuff. And then if you go back to the progressive overload, you're going to have such a better work capacity in a sense of the weight you're going to, holy crap, I now, now I don't have to do 15 or whatever reps. Now I can go back to five, eight, 10, whatever. And you're going to be able to have a mentality that's completely different for to, to crush it that way. So to be stuck in just one way, I think that might be not what to do. And I would definitely say that more that I get into coaching and program, the more years I do it, the more I do believe that, that you need to kind of rotate methodologies, or at least do it. Even if you don't really care for it, do, try not only try it out, but you might get a lot of benefit out of it. Like uh, if you think about guys like Tom Platts that would do sets of 20, 30, 50 squats, yes, his legs were genetic and I'm not going to go, like I'm not putting in his legs down and saying they're all genetics, but there are like success leaves clues. You know what I mean? Like, like, so what did he have he had the brutal intensity he had the stretching he had the this it's it's when people look too far into just the program okay i want to see what arnold did for his chest or i want to see what tom platts did for his legs that that's looking too much at the microscope and you should back up and see what did he do like i think tom said he only squatted once a month at the end because he knew his legs couldn't handle it so then then people go oh really so it wasn't just squat 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 no because he could lift so much for so many reps for so long that he could only his body couldn't handle it and that's when you see people like dorian who he would do the rest pause stuff almost dc style but then he had to give that up for the one set because he could harness that intensity into that one set that anything more would have been too much and it would have been counterproductive and that's a really good topic we should kind of get into is is uh what is overtraining and what is overreaching and and uh, how to work that into your programming too yeah, yeah, because the you know the weight the recover you're you know you're talking about recovery and recovery. A lot of people think of recovery as, am I sore? How do I feel? Do my muscles feel recovered? When in reality, for an advanced trainee that has good nutrition, um, you know they have supplementation around their workouts or whatever during the day, whatever it might be to enhance recovery. Chances are, recovery of their nervous system is going to be far outweigh muscular recovery. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. And that's, and that's where the overtraining thing comes in because don't get me wrong. I mean, your joints might be inflamed and they might need a break. Um, that definitely happens, uh, just overuse or bad movement patterns or whatever. Um, and muscular recovery might be an issue, but normally unless it's like a super low calorie situation, it's probably going to come down to you, what your nervous system can handle. For sure. At least for me personally, that has been the biggest struggle for me um, for years is just figuring out, okay, how can I actually train progressively for more than four weeks and without, you know, for more than a couple weeks without having to deload all the time. Right. Um, and it's because I, I don't think I have the best nervous system to begin with. And then I have a high workload. Um, I like to train intensely. So, you know, that's been, that's been a huge learning curve for me after many mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, you might not be able to get that even with, even with a coach. Cause how, how do you gauge 
uh, unless you've got in in person, you're watching them in person to to gauge someone else's CNS, right? Because there, there's no, there's it, it will leave clues again, right? Like if you if all of a sudden you're mentally foggy, you're physically foggy, uh, th- those those are some signs. But now is that just because you're not sleeping enough? Is that the CNS? So that that's where the it's like surfing the curve is where it's is like you're basically you're on a surfboard and you got to watch. Are you starting to lean away from the wave? Are you leaning into the wave? And that's and that's going to be like you said, just with years and like and and, and I, I bet you you would call yourself a liar if you said i've got austin figured out 100 percent. i don't think you do no. and that's nothing against you but that's because i think you're smart enough to know that you will never have it 100 percent. but you, you you're not at 50 anymore you're definitely not at 60 you're at least floating higher like you said and you're learning from the mistakes you're going okay well that didn't work so no no i can't put that in anymore or you can even look at that and see did that not work because maybe your work volume was too high and you have an edification in months. So then, oh, okay. And then this is what I'm talking about is that how you can really go, you can Google a great program. Like if you wanted to find someone's uh, template of a progressive overload program, it'll probably be there and it will work. Anything will freaking work in the beginning as long as it has, like like Austin said, either a progressive volume or progressive overload or something in terms of it's, it's somehow making you better, even if it's the same sets for a while. But if you be it up and you do it you will get better and then when you drift into intermediate or into advanced that's when it does become more tricky and you really do the whole listen to your body i'm gonna i'm gonna say you got to listen to the mind a heck of a lot more like you said i would definitely agree it it bleeds into 70 30 maybe 75 25 in terms of uh, mind to body and the example i like to give is that like almost like the body is kind of built to like a high school <laughs> in a sense of it has the chess club and it has the jocks. Yes, I know there's band people, whatever, but let's just say that the school was completely comprised of the chess club and it was comprised of the jocks. The jocks is the body and the jocks, no offense to the jocks, but they're going to they're gonna do it every time. You, they're going to go play sports and they're going to feel great. They're going to feel fine. They're not going to know it. But if you piss off the, the, the chess club, which is the, the mental, they're going to be the ones say, screw you. I'm 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 out of here. And and if if the, the, so basically what I'm going with that is that the, the the school won't work without the chess club. They'll be they'll be like right. a riot or whatever. And so you but but the jocks will always go to war. The body will always go in there. Will always do something. But if the chess club is pissed off, your mind you you aren't going to be able to work to that max capacity. And that that's just I felt that way for years. And I know that like just everyone says oh go into the gym and just do the workout anyway like. If something's really like, let's say, I don't know, someone passed away or something like that in the or the mind is just not there. Works not good. Whatever. P- pick your reason that is, or, or, or the CNS is getting beat up from the overload. Don't ignore that. Like the whole, you know, no pain, no gain like that. There, It's there. But that's not really what what I think should be the biggest uh, factor there is just going in and showing up like yeah you're going to have some crappy workouts but if you're starting to notice all workouts are crappy strength is going down volume is going down you don't want to be there i think that's the chess club getting a little bit too pissed off yep and you made there's two points there's two big points there that i think need reiterated sure. is that you i would say that you know like you said i probably have myself maybe let's say i have myself 90 percent figured sure, yep. out okay That's great. That 10%, I will never figure that out. And why? Because that 10% is the fact that my life demands outside of the gym change. Sure. All the, you know, and maybe not all the time. And some people, their life's very, you know, it's very much routine for a lot of people. But the thing is, there's unknown stressors that have impact on your nervous system that you can't, you can't predict. So the program that worked for you last year, might not work for you in 2018 because, you know, you had 2018 might be a rough year for you. You might have a lot of additional, um, you know, a lot of additional stressors. And guess what? Your your recovery ability just went down. Absolutely. Um, I love that you said that. Yeah. So that's just when you think, and, and you know, and just when you think, you know, the programming and the combination of variables that works best for you. Well, chances are that it was just the best for that time it was just the best at that moment Mm -hmm. um you know it might not you can definitely have clues and take things away like i know there there are some things that i just can't do like i can't you know i couldn't do full workouts with all sets to failure duh i'm not ever going to be able to do that even if i just slept all day i love that you're you're gonna say that because we're gonna go into that in a bit for sure so yeah okay you can't do all sets to failure for sure right so i mean it's not like I know there are some obvious things that I just couldn't do. 
And I know there's some probably obvious things that just wouldn't, you know, would be no benefit to me or things that I could probably always do, Mm -hmm. but you have to take into account lifestyle stuff. I mean, I've, I have clients where I change, I change the, their frequency of training and their volume and intensity and things like that simply based on, simply based on life stressors. Because I mean, I have some people that, especially a good example, especially like younger people that are in their early twenties that are, they're, you know, trying to figure out their career. Maybe they're switching jobs a lot. They just got an apartment, you know, and they're, they're paying bills. Like a lot in their life keeps changing around and shifting. They're not, they're not quite in that routine yet. Mm -hmm. Um, one week they might be stressed as hell and another week they might be good. Um, yeah, I mean, their, their capacity is going to be different. And I mean, I've, you'll have a program right now and I might say, I get their check in. I'm like, nope, nope, you're stressed. You are, your recovery ability is going to shit. I'm what I just saw that all your sleep last week was poor and yada, yada, yada this week. I want you to follow the same template, but I want you to knock all your RPEs down by two points or something, you know, right. right? You know what I mean? So something, and that's just a generic example, but if you got, you know, you get my point. And I think the other, the, uh, trying to think of what was the other there was another point there i started talking too much and now i forget maybe it'll come (laughs) no no problem (laughs) well but i'll I'll touch on that too how you said the 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 mental capacity uh especially here in alberta i know that i've got a lot of my guys and girls they'll do pretty pretty intense shifts and pretty intense laborious shifts in a sense of they'll have uh seven on seven off or even 14 on seven off or even crazier 21 on and seven off so that I have to kind of gauge the programming when they're away. They'll go into these things called camps and they'll work and they'll work, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour days. And so I'll actually have two different uh, programs for them during the program in a sense of when they're at work, maybe they only get three or four workouts in. Maybe it's switched around a bit. Like you said, that RPE is going down a bit. Uh, And then when they're home, I call it the give it weeks, right? Where now they're home. They literally don't have any work. They're basically a pro athlete for God's sake. I'll have them wake up, go do some fast cardio because that's going to be great for them. Then they come home, nap, sleep, eat, go back, crush the gym. And I might even get them to do that for their, for their six days in a row, especially if they're feeling good. Like I'll get to know how much uh, physical exercise, exertion they have at work and things like that so then there's it's almost like a we'll say like a volume knob right like when you can have it at 10 and blast some music do it when you got to turn it down a little bit to know five or six you got to do it and that is that will keep them progressing as opposed to if they had or attempted that same program just because coach said so or because bodybuilding.com said so they will burn out and and, and then the physical will affect that mental just like you said and now we've got now we've got way too much going on and so that's where you you need that expertise in a sense once you you get there because the amount of frustration you can see with someone saying i'm doing the program and i'm going backwards or i'm doing the program i'm not getting results is is more prevalent than most people uh think for sure yeah and that you actually touched on my second point so yes i did it (laughs) yes more more or less good you know the uh that mentality of do it as it's written no matter what type of thing right um and I think there's, you know, there's a time and a place where you might just be in a bad mood or something and you're letting other things, you know, kind of dictate your mood for that day. Yeah, that probably doesn't mean you need to skip your workout. Oh, for sure. Um, yep. Yeah, there's but, it's, a, it's a scale for sure. Right. And that's and this comes back to good feedback and honest feedback within yourself. So even if you're not even if you're working with a coach, well, we're not mind readers, you know, mm-hmm. we can't we can't like pull feedback out of thin air. Um, you know, it's in how oh, the art of giving feedback is like a whole new thing. Oh um, gosh. Yes. That's like a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother discussion because I mean, <laughs> giving good precise feedback and not just telling us like what you, you know, what you did last night. Um, that's, you know, it's two different things. Feedback doesn't necessarily mean quantity of words in your update. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, you know what I mean? But anyhow, um, you talked about, like I said, the, uh, doing the program, no matter what. So my, my biggest thing with myself, and this may be not, may not be the most common, you know, common trend is that I could literally mentally just dismantle myself until I was, you know, just a lump and couldn't move and was probably bedridden. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but some people, you know, some people will stop naturally. They, they stop well before that because physically they're like, this hurts or I'm uncomfortable or I don't feel good or whatever. So their mind stops them beforehand. But then you have the other camp where they, their mind will outwork their body. And that's a dangerous thing sometimes. Oh, and and that's wonderful. You said that I have a permanent subluxion on my left clavicle because of that, because I apparently, especially in my back and my upper body have an ungodly pain threshold. My uh, massage therapist says that I am in the top 5%. And he says, he's, uh, if you were to think about all the people that he's, this is a, he's a 40, I think 44 year old man. Bodybuilder has seen, seen it and done it. He's won heavyweight championships himself, da, da, da. But he said, I am in that upper echelon so that my mind, so I don't have that pain receptor feedback that I can go too far and then, then now, like you said, my mind saying, no, you can handle this where it, whereas I should have stopped and that, that can actually hold me back a month. Like I've got that permanent subluxion now and I have a, a reverse winging scapula. I won't get into it, but I don't have a wing scapula. My, my rotator cuff does this really weird thing and I'm paying for that because of how stupid I was not physically, but mentally as like a push, like push past the pain and things. Those are all cool for memes and whatever the whole, Oh, I can't walk for five days after leg day. That's cool as a joke. It's not cool in any other regard. And like, I, I have to laugh, but like if clients say, yo, I was, yo, couldn't walk downstairs for three days. I'm like, and, and cause I, I, I don't joke a lot on assessments because of this. And I say, do you really mean that? Like, is, are we now five weeks into the program and it is taking you three days to be able to walk down the stairs at an okay rate? Or are you actually, and the, no, well, no, it's actually only like a day. I'm like, okay, because that's very valuable feedback because that is too much. And that is going way past what, what I want for recovery, like three days, like that, like of, of pure pain five weeks in that. Yeah, that's no. Yep. You nailed it. You nailed it. And that's. Like I said, the recovery giving, I'm sorry, giving good feedback is, it's definitely an art form. I think some people are just better at it than others naturally. But um, honestly, I have people that I've probably worked with, let's say I work with them for a year. Half of what I've done in the updates is, it's not like I'm sitting there giving them, you know, have a lesson plan or I'm teaching them or anything, right, yeah, but yeah. I do, I do correct what they're saying. And I do try to help them channel things and focus on what's actually needed. I mean, I give a template when I do my updates, like I have a, I have a basic template that I will start with and then I might modify it depending on the person, but it'll have, it has categories on it. And I, I let them know. I'm saying, Hey, you can copy and paste this into your update and fill in each category or put, you know, in a, in there, if there's nothing for the, for sure, you know, for that particular category. And then we kind of, we might add or take away a category as we go because it's just, that's what the person needs. But, um, I'll, I'll get people that they, they type out these super long updates in and fill out each category, but it's literally nothing that I need to know. Yep. I Um, I completely agree. Yep. So guys, you know, if, if you are working with a coach, even if it's not one of us, um, you know, think about that. Think about take away from these episodes. Okay. This is what's valuable and this is what's not valuable. Um, and really think about it when you are, you know, typing that into your update. Is this, does this make any difference or is this just filler? Absolutely. Uh, in one of our episodes that's coming up, we're definitely going to have one. It's going to be called how to be a good client or, or how to have a good coaching client relationship. Because I think a lot of people don't really know what to expect in that. Like I've even been, I've been masquerading around calling this thing. Like uh, coaching is, is way more than just what you weigh. Cause I've heard like horror stories on one way, whereas they want daily updates with everything. Okay. That's one extreme. And then I've got others that want the weight, maybe no pictures for weeks on end. And like both are, futile methods right it's almost going to be going to get into how to gauge your own training program how to gauge your progress is going to be an individual set of questions for instance let's say if i have uh someone who's got a new form of birth control i want them to go into that heavier right or if it's a new client versus a more advanced client like i'm going to say how is uh what what were so now for instance perfect like how you said that you can you add things into the template or not i'm going to say what's your work rotation right now whereas other clients i don't need to say that because I know it's always nine to five type of thing, right? So I'll have them say at the top, yep. this was a week off from work. This is when I did the, the, the give it workout. It's like, oh, okay, cool. 
So do not drift too far into um, that because we definitely we got lots to say about that. Um, let's talk about when to change a program or when when how to know when it stopped being effective if it was effective or kind of what to go from that so what do you usually do for your program uh, makeups austin how do you kind of build them oh i like this one because yeah buddy. this is another it depends yeah exactly um, i love it there yeah, you go yeah of course right um but yeah i mean with with as far as like time of each program um i'll put i might have blocks where i build them let's say I'm using like an Excel spreadsheet or sure. something. Um, cause I do sometimes, sometimes I know some people do them like they super elaborate and they all look the same, but honestly, sometimes I have Excel. I have stuff that's on Excel. I have stuff that's on Microsoft word. Oh, I know. Um, yep. I know. Yeah. I, I, get, because, I get you. Yeah, Good. Some of the detailed ones where I'm typing a lot of instructions, I'm putting that on word because I'll just type it. You got it. Uh, but <laughs> anyhow, you know, I might put, let's say it's an Excel spreadsheet. Well, it might have space for four weeks. We'll say it has a four week block on there. I have some progression built in. Um, this person has a pretty regular schedule, you know, there chances are they'll probably be able to go through the program. And because I know their body, they're probably going to be able to progress within those on that four week block. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at the end of four weeks, I say, well, you know, where's my new program? I'm like, okay, hold up before we change anything. You know, we're looking at, I've been obviously getting their feedback in each update already, but um, I'm, I'm like, well, how's your, you know, your progression's been great. Do we need to change the program? I love this. Well, well, maybe not. I just thought because I'm at the end, no, no, yeah. we're not changing anything because you've just, you've just hit a PR on every single workout for the last four weeks straight. So how about we just continue with the block? You know, maybe I'll have them reset at week one and try to go through and beat um you know beat the what they did on the first rotation in their second rotation um or something along those lines but i mean it dude it totally depends i mean i've had people that have done programs for oh gosh months and months absolutely on end. And, yep and the thing is i'll have people that i have they're like i said they're very routine um they're good at giving feedback and I might throw in like little, little, uh, back off or deload periods here and there, but their program is so good that they're just so damn bored of it after, you know, after four months that all I literally do is just rotate, rotate movements, but I keep the volume the same. I keep the intensity the same. I keep the rep schemes the same. Why? Because it's working. Absolutely. I love that you said that because exactly, let's say if you've got a, a male that progressive overload is his jam, you guys have just figured out between the two of you that that is how he is going to be the biggest, uh, most uh, complete bodybuilder is through progressive resistance. And then why would you change that? And and, and I've, I've got lots to say about this, man, because I, th I think if anything, people change the programs way too frigging early early and i'm talking like thank thank you uh, i believe his name is tony horton who came up with p90x is between the, oh, mu the muscle yeah. the between muscle confusion and the whole switch it up like all that is is satisfying some people's adhd i don't care if people want to come and get mad at me on that i don't mean adhd in terms of you're clinical and you are on medication i mean that you are going to the gym and you want something new and want something exciting i kind of say to people how is not, how is progressing and you reaching your goals not new and exciting? And it kind of they, it kind of takes them aback, right? Or or I'll, or I'll kind of ask in the beginning, when do you think a workout should change? And some people say weekly. Some people say every four weeks. Some people will say, oh, I have never changed my workout. And those are the extreme outliers. And we all know those guys who've been doing the same uh, chest day, the same whatever for years. And they're usually the people that look exactly the same in the gym. And that's cool. If that makes them happy and they're where they're at, don't change it. Right. But that's why, like I said, we, I asked you if you like the term training, because it is, we are training for something you're looking to get better. But, uh, like, and the, one of the wonderful examples I like to use, and I've used this many times with people is, okay, let's say we've got a workout for a week and that is you in school to be a carpenter. And then next week we change your workout. Now you're learning skateboarding. And then the next week you, we go in and you're learning astrophysics. And then the next week you go change your workout, which is equivalent to you learning baseball. When, when you come back to being a carpenter, what the fuck are you going to remember 
from being a carpenter. Like it, it, it's like sure, yes, it is a workout. Sure, it's squats. But let's say if I you, you've you've barely worked out or what, or even if you have worked out and I have squats in the first program, how are you? How are we gauging that volume? How are we gauging that progressive resistance from one friggin' week? Like I just I just don't get it. Unless of unless the only um a counter argument I have to this, I'll argue with myself right now is like let's say I do that one two three four and I go back to the carpenter and I keep doing that over weeks and weeks. But even so, then I don't think my weeks two, three, and four would be that dramatically different. So to to, to get that progress, like how are you going to gauge that? Like let's say we had a, a five to eight week, and then I completely changed the exercises, completely changed the rep scheme, completely changed, and and that all that is doing is you are not going to learn that program, let alone have the ability to smash it. And I, I was just telling a couple of girls in my assessments this morning to them is that the first one to three, potentially four, depending upon how new they are, how good they are, is that that's going to be you learning not only the workout that that we create. Uh, learning where it is in your gym, uh, trying to make it and then gauging the weight for it because you're not going to necessarily know if you've only done reps three to, sorry, five to eight and I all of a sudden give you 15 on a squat. You don't know what you could squat for 15. Sure, there's some calculators out there, but you're not going to know exactly. And so then you you go into this and then by week three or four, that's when you can, okay, I've got it. And that's when I, I when it, one of the things I say to my people is now it turns into ballet. Now it's when it gets beautiful. And that's and, and and that's when you can really start to to smack it around, and that's when I call it the real progress starts because now okay, this is how much weight I know I can lift for this. This is what I'm looking at for the volume overload, and that's when uh, I, I I like to really uh, kick the volume up. Well, let's say I give them you know two sets, maybe three sets of uh, working sets, we'll say to kind of get them acclimated. So they okay, I know the work. Okay, now we're gonna go for four working sets, or now we're gonna make that last set a failure set here and there. And I think that's what you were talking about with like modifiers, intensity things like. Maybe you'll say, okay, this these next two weeks, I want your last set to be a drop set of okay. this, this, and this. Okay, or, or no, okay, let's do these these two to failure. Okay, no, let's take the, those last exercise and do a Widowmaker set, which is like a set of 20 to 30 or something like that. But if you don't give yourself enough time to make a program work, how do you know what worked? And how do you know what yeah. did what didn't work? Like like let's say for instance you did D, let's just keep picking on DC because it's there. I love DC training. I really I'm just jealous that I can't do it. So let's say you did DC training and your legs blew up like crazy. That's awesome. Let's say your shoulders nothing happened. Well that that is telling you something that maybe either if, outside of technique being crappy, outside of t- intensity being crappy, maybe you need a little bit more volume for the shoulders. Maybe you need a different exercise for the shoulders. And that's and that's. The, we'll call it the real feedback, right? Like, and and, and we're not going to go into it too far, but but like that's when you really do need to be honest with yourself, like Austin was saying, and not only that, but honest with the coach. Because if, if if like not only that, but we can look at the photos. That's why photos are so golden, right? Because if I if I look and I see those legs are huge, and I see your shoulders haven't moved, then I'll start asking some questions, like, okay, like what was your logbook looking like for the shoulders? Did you get stronger? Okay, if you got stronger, that's even cooler. That means that now you are um, doing some really dense training, and I bet you now you're. Strong, but that proves the point that strength isn't everything. It's not directly correlational to size. It can be like a stronger muscle is usually going to be a bigger muscle, but it doesn't have to be. So therefore, that's when you can start uh, altering programs. And that's when I say that last, we'll say after weeks three and four, like if it's just like Austin said, if it doesn't stop working, why on earth would you ever want to change it up? Especially if everything is working, don't touch that dial, man. If it's it's a good TV show, binge, man. Keep going. Yeah. And- like you, like you said, with the fir- learning the program, you you don't even get confident with movement patterns and the weight that you're handling for at least a couple weeks. Yeah, for sure. Um, let let's take even an advanced trainee. Okay. Yep. Um, they start a new program, and they are it's it's leg day. Okay, and they are squatting, and they're using a certain rep range and a certain amount of sets. And they've squatted a million times before, obviously. They're advanced. They have a pretty good squat. Sure. You know, yep. that's fine. They're comfortable doing squats, but they haven't trained in this rep range for a while right. on squats. Guess what? <laughs> They're not going to be as strong as they can possibly be or get the best execution and the best tension on those sets of, let's say, eight reps because they've been doing sets of, they've been doing triples. Um, gotcha. They've been doing sets of three or they've been doing sets of 15 or something. Mm-hmm. Um they're they're almost it's not like you're relearning a whole movement pattern because you know the movement pattern you know how to execute it properly but you are relearning that rep range and you're re 
acclimating yourself to that rep range and feeling confident with it. And then you can really crank it. You know, you do a week or two and you're like, okay, this way, the first week, who knows? That's a, you have a gauge of what you're probably going to use because you've done it before, but it's still a feeler week. Um, you know, you're going to have a good workout, but you might find, oh, I can do three or four more reps than what my program prescribed, you know, next week, adjust it. You're in a better spot. By the third week, you're like, okay, I know what I can do. I'm really going to hammer this workout. Um, and you add 25 pounds to your squat on week three. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's – even advanced people are – they need time on programs too. The only time I would say somebody – like if a program just absolutely isn't working, and normally that's for more like a – be more like from a volume or intensity standpoint. If right, I just for find sure. – They do it for the first week and it absolutely just buries them. Okay, well, then we probably need to back things off a little bit. But outside of that kind of scenario, I can't really see many scenarios where I would need to change it week to week. No, that's right. Exactly. I I think that's a little like outside of that, that you touched right on that too, which I was talking about that needs to state like for instance, the dude was doing three or the dude was doing 15. Now he does eight. Yeah. Like, you know, and and I bet you you do this too is, you know, pick a safe weight, right? Don't, don't pick something like, Oh, like, uh, like let's say a calculation. If he was doing three, okay, I can do three for 500 pounds. So now I can probably do eight for 400 pounds. No, 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 no. Pick very conservative. There's always more weight. There's it's called progressive resistance, not regressive <laughs> resistance so you know you, you can you can do that and 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 that's what will then breed into making that program and exactly and that, and that is the perfect amount of the changing it up when i say the the need state you don't need to go from weight training to yoga you can just vary that rep range it can still be progressive resistance and this is a perfect uh, jump into the the convolution that's been going on lately because there was kind of a race in a sense of there was different systems were coming out and they were coming out like crazy. For instance, there was P90X and then there was FST7 and then there was um, uh, ultra slow training, ultra slow uh, concentric, ultra slow eccentric, ultra slow this. Then there was drop set training this, drop set training trap, then, then running the rack, which would be going from five, five pounds to 10 pounds to 15 pounds and all the way back down and all this stuff. And I would see people blindly throw it in and not only blindly throw it in, but blindly throw in everything. Like, let's say you were doing a five second eccentric negative lift on the leg press with bands rest paused. Oh, my God. It's like that is way too much. We'll call them intensity markers or different styles of training. It's just too much. Um, not only that, but then I know, for instance, when I started doing or tried out uh, some, one of the one of the guys training systems that that's popular about like going, you know, four seconds on the way down pause for a second then two seconds on the way up no pause at the top and so there was four different uh time signatures in there i was not focused one iota on the intensity of it i was too busy counting things inside my head and that is just to me completely missing the boat and that is you you are not and so not only did i not remember how many reps i was training if i didn't have a partner to tell me okay that's enough well then i'd be like well, sh- well shoot i didn't even get to the reps that i wanted to or i was way too light and then so these factors can be, it's just way too much. And yeah, they're cool. Drop sets are cool. Training every set to failure is cool. But I and I, want, I love that you said the whole every, every set to failure here because I just had someone this morning in assessment said every set is to failure. And outside of beginners where overtraining is just not going to happen, like you're not going to, a, a dude is not going to overtrain with 100 pounds on the bench press training every set to failure. If anything, that's a good thing because then he can acclimate and get to something we'll call true failure or whatever. But if you can do that true failure on every set and your feedback is I'm okay, I'm going to step in and say I don't think you're training to failure. <laughs> and that's going to bruise some egos and bruise some hearts. But if you train to real failure, true failure, whatever you want to call it, on absolutely every set, and let's say you've got three sets of 10 and you've got sec seven, eight exercises per muscle group, there is no way – that those last couple exercises, that failure is going to be – Half of the weight, if not less, of what you can usually use or else you are not even remotely close to failure. And that's something that I want to talk about, too. I talked about a little bit last time called junk volume, whereas you'll see these monster long workouts in terms of five days a week, an hour and a half, two hour long workouts, and they're going 
all out the entire time and they're adding in this and they're adding in that and they're doing uh, incline flies, flat flies, decline flies, incline press, flat press, decline press, cable crossovers, dips. And it's like, whoa, whoa, how, how is the intensity staying up? How are you like, out, even with uh, t- having a pre-workout at the beginning and having a pre-workout halfway through the workout, how are you physically, let alone mentally handling that? And so that's the, then that junk volume. The only way I know that that will work is because let's say the first two, three, four exercises, they, they just aren't giving it. They're not intense or whatever. And so then the, the, the workout finally works like that first half hour is maybe a glorified warm up, let alone a, a, an actual workout. So that's something to pay attention to, too, is that the, another way to kind of build your programming is if figure out how many days that you can work out per week. Productively, it's it's right on my questionnaire. It says not 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 necessarily um, free time or workout time that you have, but how much workout time do you think you have that you can give it? And some people will say four days, some people will say five days, some people will say eight days, and I just kind of laugh, of course. But you they, then you you take that, and that will directly correlate to the volume too. And the volume can also mean time. So, for instance, if you've got four workouts a week, maybe they got to bleed into that uh, hour hour and, and fifteen hour and a half uh, mark. But now, if you've got five Five or six days, you're probably looking at that 50 to 70 minute mark because then the total volume can be the same. You can still crush it. But as soon as the, the, the volume and the volume both kick up, let's say the, the, the days and the time, uh, the, then you're, of course, you're taking into lifestyle factors, taking job into consideration. Like that's going to be a lot, man. Like uh, like six days a week, that that's the max. I really don't like people outside of cardio or, or abs or something, or maybe a garbage day, I'll call it. Training every day, especially in advanced training, training every frigging day per week with no day off i don't know man what are your kind of thoughts on what i just said there about volume timing and everyday training uh well if you i'm gonna i'll bring it back a little bit more add a little bit of science in here and there my boy just um (laughs) yeah i mean if you look at if you look at some of the studies i mean and there has been some good stuff i mean there are some good researchers on training and hypertrophy the only obvious thing is that they can't take into account every single person in their different context. Correct. But yeah. let's let's put that aside. Um, it seems like, at least from what I've seen, that total volume. If you're if we're talking about the variable volume itself, total volume is the biggest thing. Because mm-hmm. um, I know that high frequency got really really popular for a while. Oh man, we're seeing three like three uh, seeing the body parts three times a week and stuff. Like yeah, I know what right. you mean. Yeah, right. Which which I see application for that. If the only <sighs> that comes back to recovery, the recovery thing again. Of course. Yep. Um, if you're saying if it's a weak body part and you're wanting to add more total volume to it. Let's say it's your uh, it's your legs. Okay, so that's a hard that's a large muscle group hard to recover from, right? Mm-hmm. So you couldn't if you wanted to add volume to that. Chances are, if you wanted to do I don't know, we'll just I'm throwing out a number. If you wanted to do over thirty sets, thirty working sets in a week, thirty working sets on legs is a pretty good amount. That's hefty for um, sure. Yeah, you probably wouldn't do it in one workout mm-hmm. because. You know, because for one, the workout would be ridiculously long. Mm-hmm. And secondly, your workout by the end of the workout just probably wouldn't be very productive because exactly. you'd be tired. Um, and it would probably take you a pretty long time to recover from it. So let's split it up. Let's do 15 and 15 or let's do 12 and 18 or whatever, mm-hmm. um, you know, and let's split that up into two days a week or maybe even let's split it up into like two primary workouts and then you have you just do some of that capillary work. You got it later you know, added to other workouts. So you get your total volume in for the week and you split it up into, you know, you're actually, your legs are physically contracting, doing sets three times a week. Yep. Um, cause when people hear that, I think that they might, they need to understand that it's not three full leg workouts a week. Like that's not, that's not what people are doing. At least I surely hope not. Um, and yeah, and it's the same for any muscle group. I mean, I, me, for example, I've done higher frequency stuff on different muscle groups that mm-hmm. I needed to bring. Up. And that's just because I'm splitting up the total volume. Um, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not going to, I'm not doing 40 or 50 sets of arms in one workout. Well, because it just thrashes my elbows. You got it. Uh, you know what I mean? So I'm, so I split it up. I, I add, 
like right now, for example, I do, um, I'll, I'll hit biceps and triceps twice. Well, currently it's twice a week each, but I'll do on Saturdays, they'll, I'll hit them both together Mm -hmm. with, with, um, a little bit of back work. It's a a small amount. And then I'll do, I'll add biceps to the end of my pulling workout and I'll add triceps to my pushing workout earlier in the week. Sure. Yep. You know what I mean? So they're all getting hit and I've done them up to three times a week before. And, but again, it's all going back to the total volume thing. So if, you know, anyone that's maybe curious about frequency, um, frequency is good. If, if it helps you recover better, I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, but just don't, I, I don't think it should be something ridiculous where you're trying to hit legs four times a week because in reality, your volume per session is going to be really low. Um, your nervous system's not even going to get warmed up enough to have that's right sets. Like I'm, if I'm squatting to even get good working sets on squats, like it takes me time to warm up, you know? So I'm not going to want to do that three times a week. That's that's just ridiculous. Yep. So that's kind of my thought on the whole frequency thing. Take your total volume, split it, split it. However works best for your schedule and your recovery. Yep. Absolutely. Um, to, to kind of, to touch on that a little bit more too, is the, uh, like, uh, let's say for the arms, then if you read a program or you even receive a program from a coach and you can't feel the exercise, like th- this is going to be a very, uh, interesting topic because there's, there's pump involved, there is uh, hydration involved, uh, food involved, but exercises you feel are going to be exercises that work. Now, it's not that you need to feel, for instance, let's say you squat, you're not going to have one specific muscle probably feel during the actual set. It could, I have seen people say, I only feel that in my glutes, that's fine, or, or others, I only feel that in my quads, that's fine. But if you're doing arm curls, let's say just standard supinated barbell curl, and you can't feel that in your biceps at all, and you have been training for a bit or something, that might not be an exercise for you. And I'll give my example of myself with the flat bench press. I have never been a good flat bencher, let alone did I ever really feel it in my chest (coughs) maximally in a sense, right? And I gave you the example at the beginning of this of like the one-arm pec decks. And I had to do that, and that worked. So I finally did, I think it was, I want to say six months of starting every frigging push or chest workout with one-arm pec deck to get it there. And then finally I had started developing a chest and then when i started then when i took that out and started with other exercises i could feel the chest working my my chest now had the proprioceptive awareness which means i knew what my chest did because you can look at enough anatomy textbooks and say oh okay the chest brings the arm across the across the body towards towards the center and but they and, but that's not necessarily gonna gonna click it inside your head and that's a whole other topic is like the whole mind muscle thing but so you got to feel it so where i'm going with that is that just because someone says an exercise is great you don't have necessarily have to do it so th- that's going to be feedback too and like let's say technique is okay you tw- switch technique and you still can't feel it then that's not necessarily going to be something that's beneficial inside of your program uh to, to just do it that way all the time uh i don't think there could be much more value to me, let's say if I always started with flat bench and I never felt it, like just because it's a quote unquote good exercise, I'm not going to, I, I wish I had to knew that sooner, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, you obviously have to feel it. And that's just kind of a, that just kind of comes back to biomechanics in your structure. Um, yep. And obviously how much muscles there, you know, it's yep, like, that's right. I can feel like I can feel Romanian deadlifts or straight leg deadlifts or how, whatever variation you want to call them. Sure. Really, really well, but my hamstrings are big. Um, yep. You know what I mean? I don't need to pre exhaust my hamstrings exactly. to feel exactly good. I love that you said that for sure. And and that's gonna be even more getting into the advanced stuff. Whereas if right. if if you if your if, if your arms suck uh and you always do back and then you try to sneak your arms in after back, that might not be the way to do it because that's energy systems as well, right? And because weak body part training, because this is why bodybuilding is so 
I'll, I'll say hilarious versus let's say something like strength training or powerlifting. Whereas that you can get a little bit more of a formula. Whereas this, like if anyone says they have the ultimate bodybuilding formula for everybody, they are just flat out full of it, man. Because we, we can only study hypertrophy to such a certain point before then it turns into like Austin and I's answer for everything or the start of every discussion is it depends because that is going to be it. Like we can know that let's say 12 to 15 is what to do. We can know that uh, the more volume of training you do is the best to do but then that then it's going to branch off almost like a dichotomy which is going to be so highly individual like why did uh, Ronnie Coleman do his his training the way he did Mr. Olympia why does Phil Heath do his training I don't think they're very similar at all but yet here they are is either one of them wrong probably not could either one of them done something better or different maybe but outside of like even when we get so finite and we do stuff like the emg and you watch when people's muscles do certain things like there was some really cool stuff done on girls glutes where they show girls uh (coughs) doing all of the classic glute stuff in terms of they're doing adduction or sorry abduction they were doing romanian deadlifts they were doing um hip thrusters they were doing squats and some of the girls that with all really nice big glutes some of them did not feel them at all in certain movements, but did feel them a a lot with other movements. And those were their movements. And that's what I'm kind of trying to say is that if you have a movement where, you know, you progress on that, you feel maximally that should probably be in most of your workouts, if not in all of your workouts. Cause if you just know it frigging works for you, like if you know that squats blow up your legs, keep some form of variation into them, like maybe take a break from them here and there, but that's the exact going in the exact opposite direction. When I said about the bench press, if I know that it doesn't really work, or maybe I need to put it at the end of the workout for it to quote unquote work, but to be always um, ignoring what your body says in lieu of a, a program or in lieu of what a coach says, that's kind of missing the boat there a little bit too. And that's where you do need that, that uh, understanding about your own, we'll say training programming or training uh, volume. Yep. Yep. That's yeah, it all. It's all going back to, it depends. Yeah, I know. And, and, and you that that'll be we'll change the podcast for a couple of weeks to it depends and here's why. <laughs> we should just call it. Yeah, we should call it it depends and here's why. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that would be the actual name of the podcast. Um oh. so yeah, like uh, the, we're we're just at the coming up here on an hour Austin, do you have lots to add here or anything to add? Not I mean not really because like any other topic, I mean guys, we we can provide situation. We want to provide situational stuff because we want you to be able to think, Oh, that kind of sounds like me. I'm going to try that. But, um, at the end of the day, I mean, we couldn't possibly cover every situation. There's just no, no, no. there's, there's no way. And that's, and plus, you know, that's how we make a living too. So, you know, Hey, for sure. But, but shameless plug. No, that's right. But it, and I, like outside of like, you have to think how pretentious it would be if we said, well, no, you have to do this rep range. You have to do this. Right. But the, the, the things to take away is, you know, is definitely pay attention to your body. Give yourself, let alone if you're working with a coach, good feedback. Realize that just because a program says it's going to work doesn't necessarily mean it needs to work. Take damn good notes about that. Um, in terms of, okay, so this is what worked. Take take photos, take whatever. Because the amount of times I see, not only with diet, but for training, someone will say, okay, this training program didn't work for me. And I'll go, why? Let's say they're not a client. They are a client. And I'll say, why? And they'll say, oh, well, this didn't happen. I'll say, well, were you eating enough? Were you doing this enough? So that that is, so you can have the most perfect program in the world, but if all the other factors are going to crap, it's not going to work. Uh, what else do I have to say about that? Um, to Really pay attention. If you've got high frequency, high volume, high intensity, that's probably not going to be it. I would say also don't change too much at once. Like, let's say you listen to this. You're like, oh, man, I'm going to do some failure training now. I'm going to do that. Don't you don't have to change a lot to change a lot. OK, <laughs> like you don't have to. Yeah. You did just just change one thing. Say, oh, you know what? I haven't been recovering. All of my sets have been to failure. I'm going to just try the last set on everything to failure and maybe that'll be the one little key to do it for instance let's say you are a car i love using cars if you don't buy a new car if all you needed was to friggin change your oil because that could be it man you could just maybe need some new brakes or something and then boom the, the car is working better than you whatever would have thought of uh it, it's it's gonna boil down so much to that to just listening to it it depends i know people are going to get annoyed as hell of us over the course of time saying that uh Definitely keep volume in mind, keep progressive overload in mind, and just try something out without changing it up too much. I think that's 
the best takeaways we can kind of try to give you without giving you an exact program, which we couldn't do unless we knew you in a sense, like Austin said, this yep. is a, this is a business in a sense of, or uh, we, we, it does take time. Like I, I love, I love people going and trying stuff off bodybuilding.com. That's super cool. Take notes away. And then when you're ready for someone to interpret that info for you, because I'll just go on a, a half rant here is that I love that this, which and I'll say this is just fitness has it's now turned into probably one of the most Googled things in a sense of how people really do believe that they can do it all on their own. Now, maybe that's just because I'm so neck and nose and hairline deep in this world that I know that for someone to say I know this is just hilarious but we understand in terms of Austin and I what it takes to keep that progression going and the last thing you want to do is is keep trying out programs and not knowing why they're working or not working so is that people now feel that they can do our jobs and that to me is mind numbing let alone mind blowing because like and that's cool if you really if you have been working out and you are progressing and it is eight years and you are a dude and you've gained 50 pounds naturally over the eight years and you are still progressing all the power to you man you do not need to talk to Austin and I that is not who I am talking to right now I'm saying that if you think that you know more than let's say some of the most elite athletes in the world's coaches I think you might need to take a step back and then try and hire someone. I One of the best pieces of advice I can give to people is hire a competent coach earlier in your career. It could change everything for you in terms of progress, in terms of gym happiness, in terms of anything really is get someone that knows it better than you that is willing to work with you to get you there. Yep. And it, because it is, it still takes us time. As quick as oh, we yeah. can learn your body probably a lot quicker than you can, maybe, maybe. Yep. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an overnight fix and and that's probably a reason that I you know, I don't know I don't know how you handle this, but I don't I don't do a whole whole lot of like one time programs. I do some for the right type of person, but you know, it's like we're not sitting here. We're not trying to sell you a service because if we were, we would just say that we knew everything. That's right. For um, sure. You know, yeah, for sure. because, yep, my answer sometimes is I don't know because I don't know you. Yep, exactly. And and I right. think, and I believe Dante Trudell said that best is that the people that say, I don't know, those are the ones that I respect the most. If someone says they know everything, let alone about training, diet, like that's just not only in, incorrect, but that's just, that, that's someone probably you don't want to be associating with that. That's just promising way too much. If I can promise you 30 pounds in 30 days, I can't say that. I don't know. It's ridiculous. These guarantees you see, right? And I, for, to, to comment on that, what I don't, I, ha, I have that offered as a service. Like, yes, I do make a one-time program and I'll be based upon kind of where you're at, whatever. It's like, a, I want to have a quite a bit of assessment. I'll give you something, but I'll flat out say one program is not going to make yeah. it or break it. You know, it, it's going to yeah. be something that's progressive and that's that's where I said about that need state is that over the course of the years, yes, years of training, that's when you can start formulating more towards your perfect program. Like we said about earlier, Austin's now about 90% for there, right? He probably started at 50, 40, who knows? Let's say 30. I know I started at 30 and then finally started building up to now I know enough about what I should be doing for a program that now it's going to be bang on whenever I do work with someone or I build my own programs. So the last very good piece of advice is, is I know I said, give the program a chance. I'm just going to say, give the years some chance because muscle outside of that first newbie beginner, which everyone did and everyone grabbed any program and it did something is that you are going to have to exercise patience. This is not a sport of sprinting. Yep. Yep. You're totally right. I, that's, you know, good point on the one-time programs. I do, I do them. I should have said, I should have made that clear, but my disclaimer is that uh, there's no guarantees. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's going to be a good stab. I, I, I'll offer some feedback, like if maybe an alter, if they, if I missed the mark huge on there, I, I didn't read what their job was, their lifestyle was like. I'll say, okay, sorry, Kate, you don't need five days. I think you should do four days. Here's why. Here you go. Have a good one. Right. Yep. Totally. All right, well, boys and girls, that is it from Austin and I today on training programming. You've been listening to the Mind Body Broadcast, and have a wonderful day. We'll see you guys.